the God, right? The God of all grace who's called you internals, his internal glory. And this is helpful, why? You're not gonna miss anything if you have the ESV. But here's helpful. This passage here is about God and his power, not about your suffering. So when you tend to read it out of the ESV today, it tends to be kind of suffering-centric. It's not. It's not suffering-centric. So there's a lot of suffering in this book, and we think about it as we go through it. And if you haven't been here, we have all kinds of sermons online you can watch and listen to about that. But this is about God. And so I'm going to use a little jingle, and I'm just going to kick it off this way. I, the first thing we're going to see is I want you to check what's in your gift bag. What's in your gift bag? Um, meaning this, you, you might be here this morning trying to understand who Jesus is. And we welcome you to sit and listen and think. We welcome you to ask us questions at end. You, you do what you have to do to figure out who Jesus is and what he's saying, and we are at your disposal. We will, we will endlessly buy you things and sit with you to help you figure that out, and we'll lay our lives down, literally, to help you figure that out, okay? And, but then there's most of us in this room, we know the Lord. We've understood what he said, and, and there's, uh, he's offered us something, and then he's paid for it somehow, right? So the, what has he offered us? The paid for it is through Christ, but what has he offered us? sometimes our heart answers are a little different than our head answers. And sometimes our head answers are incomplete. So when you look in the gift bag of like, what is God offering us? Um, I want you to check it today because I bet you um, there's something in that gift bag that, um, well, because you're human and you're not dead yet, um, it's something that you've only begun to scrub the, the packaging off. It's something beautiful. But a lot of times when we think about what I've got in this thing from the Lord, we think, of, we think of some good things, but there are some magnificent things in this, magnificent things. And today in this text, um, I, I want to look at the first thing that he offers us in that. And so um, here we are. Here's my first point. Um, more than observing, our future is to share in God's glory. More than observing, our future is to share in God's glory. And you might think at first like, and that does what for me? Let me help you out a little bit and just discover with me. Just, let's just, just climb up on the edge of why this is pretty amazing. So we're, we're in our text. A lot of us come to God and we think the thing he offers us is getting off the hook. Escape from a perilous future. Um, maybe help for today. And those things are all true. Vast escape from a perilous future. Great help for today. But it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning of what he's offering us. So if you look in that verse there, I just want to draw your attention to one thing. The God of all grace who's called you into his eternal glory in Christ. Let me just read it one more time. Slow it down. See if you can kind of catch what's saying said here. The God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. It's not just simply saying the God who is got his bus revving and warmed up to take you to heaven at the end of life. The God has called you to his glory. I want to read a couple of texts to you um, and, and read something that I think for a lot of us you may never have heard. And for some of us we've heard it, but we know once we've heard it, we know how far on the fringe we are of understanding it. So here's a few of these. This is out of John 17, verse 22 to 24. It says this, The glory, this is Jesus speaking to the Father, the glory that you have given to me, I've given to them that they may be perfectly one. So glory that, he's, that the Father gave to the Son, I've now given to them. That's funny. That they may be perfectly one, even as we are one. That's why church family life works, right? I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, and folks, that's us, and our brothers in Nambia this morning, and our friends in Siberia, and our brothers and sisters all around the world, and the brothers and sisters who died in the first century, and the ones who will come after us, like all of these brothers and sisters, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you've given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world, and what he's asking there is not for a great audience. What he's asking there is for our joy. There's something that happens to us when we see Jesus glorified. There's a day coming where we will see Jesus unveiled in his glory. And when we are in the presence of that, it is to our great advantage. Everything that Jesus is praying there is for his boys and girls. He's like, man, and Lord, please take all these, these boys and girls and bring them in and let them be there when I'm glorified so that they might participate in it. 
2 Timothy 2.12 says this, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us, but we'll reign with him. Romans 8.18 says this, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed in us. Glory be revealed in us in a future thing. It's kind of weird, right? So we're gonna, this is like outside of my bubble of thinking. So what happens is we start marching around this thing. And, and uh, we had a class a couple weeks ago, and there's a number of topics in Scripture. We don't come to solve, solve them and figure like we have it all encapsulated in bullet points. These are like a giant crock pot of amazing soup that you ladle off of all of your days. You just Things keep adding to it, and you enjoy it, and you enjoy it, and you enjoy it. It fills you with understanding. It's something you continue to dine off all your life, but it gets better with age. In uh, Romans 8, it says, with the word is to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us, that the creation itself, so the earth, will be set free from its bondage corruption, and that's our fault, and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So, when God cleans up everything, he, he, the wording here is it's connected to, to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Something happens to us. Something happens to us that this world is dying to experience. When, when the managers of this world are all fixed up and sin is ripped out of us and we actually get to taste the glorification of God, something happens to us and our world is dying to experience it. Romans 9.23 in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy. Not just how nice he's going to be to us, but the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory. And I catch this weird theme coming up again and again. Um, and if you feel like it's outside your wheelhouse, it's okay. It really is outside your wheelhouse. But if you know Jesus, it's going to be your wheelhouse. And so we just creep up on it. So even as we go along here, just ask God for little bits and pieces of understanding this more and more. There's a future coming to us where we get to participate in God's glory. 1 Corinthians 2.7, But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. Massive theme goes through Scripture. Kind of a hidden theme. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, just this undercurrent that, that it's, it's, it's a rock you hear bumping under the boat all your life and you don't know until all of a sudden God raises it out of the water and goes, there's a future for you. And it's the glory of God. And we not only get to observe it, but I put up there, our future is to share in God's glory somehow. There's more text than that. There's more text than that. So somehow we tend to think, some of us in the room, a fair bit of us in the room. We tend to think that, that our future is an eternally safe place, or heaven, okay? Cheaply said, heaven is an eternally safe place where we have the freedom to um, successfully obsess with God's gifts and yet pay some level of attention to them, that that's what the future is coming, that it's a safe spot for you, and you just get to do, it's, you know, streets of gold, seas of glass, whatever all that is, and you just get to live it up, and then you go pay your dues to him in adoration or whatever. But that's not the picture of it. God is the treasure now. God is the treasure then. God is the center of heaven. Everything works off of him. And he's full of gifts, but we will obsess with the giver, not the gifts on those days. And we get to participate in this, and somehow, we don't exactly know how all this kind of stuff works, but we get deeply in on this deal. We get to share in some of his glory. We get to reign with him. And just because we can't put our little minds around it doesn't mean uh, it's legit. In fact, it's an honor for us. Every time God brings to us things that are beyond us, it's an honor that he's even just opened the tip at it. Right? He's opened just the edge of it, and we can look into it. And he goes, he said, I want you to know this because I want you to trust me that I have things planned for you that eye has not seen, ear has not heard. I want you to know that I have a, a future ahead of you, and I want to amaze you in that. Um, it's more than just watching his glory. We get to be firsthand participants in it, enjoy it somehow. It says the nature itself is looking forward to this when this happens to us, something unfolded later. later. Um, and what it does is it inspires hope. So, so we, in general, as a culture, are people who do have a concept of anticipation uh, anticipation that makes us hard workers, right? We work hard. I know a lot of us. And, um, and then the ones of you guys that I don't know, I can see you. I can kind of see how you're dressed. It's kind of dark in here, but no one's wearing sackcloth this morning. Um, 
you know, no one's, no one's here really dressed in great impoverishment. We are people that know how to work and work hard. Um, we know what it means to invest in things. So when you invest, every time you invest, you simply see something in the future that is worthwhile, some suffering now. So you think, you know what? That potential of one out of a six pack is worth me getting out of bed this morning and doing some sit-ups. You think, you know what? Not bumming off my kids in the future and like getting government cheese is worth me saving up for some retirement right now. So I won't spend all the money I'm making right now to save up for my retirement later. Um, most of us in the room realize that, you know what, um, digging ditches, this was my dad's job back in the, the day. Like, uh, he did concrete, and so his way of teaching Scott Burns that you want to get education is he'd bring me out to dig footings and stuff like that for concrete. I quickly learned that this is probably not something I want to do for all my life. And I went, ah, the hope of not having slipped discs by the age of 35 in my back is worth while this horrible thing in front of me called college. And I should probably not play the video game now and study. I should probably go do this now. I should probably even make a student loan now because the future warrants immediate suffering. We all do it. We all know what it means to have hope and therefore to, to hold on to a certain level of discomfort to accommodate that. The question is, when God says, check this out, do we believe it? When he says, hey, look at, this, look at this future of what I have for you. I mean, not only are you safe. Yes, you're safe. Yes, I'll never let you go. Yes, I'm taking you home. But look at what's home. You share in the glory of God. And he just, it just peaks a little bit, but he does it again and again and again in Scripture. And I didn't give you all the Scriptures that say that. So what do you do with that? And this comes down to a moment of faith and belief. Well, number one, it comes to a moment of education. So if you're like me, that concept did not strike me until much, much, much later in my walk with Jesus. So now all of a sudden I have this new piece of information, this new promise God gives, and I think, what am I going to do with it? Mm, lunch is coming up. I could just kind of shove it down because I got lunch or possibly a Sunday afternoon nap. And so I can't really wrap my head around it, so I have to admit confusion and lack of mental acuteness to someone else I'm talking to, so it's easy for me just to box it back down and because I only like to handle the things that I can wrap my hand around head around, and so I'm going to put it aside. Or do you lift that up and go, that's interesting, God. You're telling me something about my future. You're calling me into your glory through Christ. So let me chew on this. Let me, let me just, let me, you're only dripping the edge of it. Let me grab onto the edge of it and contend with that. Um, it's a promise to be believed. So check out some of these texts here. Because sometimes we don't do that. This is John 12, 43. Some people who heard about the glory of God but didn't really care about it. He says, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Romans 8, 17, spinning it more of a positive way. And if children, then heirs. So if we are children, then we are heirs and heirs with God and fellow heirs with Christ provided that we suffer with him in order that we may glorify with him. And I bring this in in saying this, that God really wraps all through this book this idea of future glory, um, Glory with Christ comes with being in Christ. And being in Christ means that we are part of his work still, where he's still reaching the world right now through us. And so we're part of this. We, we carry his information. We may be a banker. We may be a stay-at-home mom. We might be retired. We may be disabled. We might be whatever under the sun, studying everything at OSU. But we're part of this. And so therefore, since we are part of the light of Christ going into the dark world, we see two things. We see him capturing the hearts of people like us who once worked and were participants in darkness. And he gets, gets their attention, like he got our attention, and he pulls us to belief, and we go, yes, I do believe that. I don't want to be against you anymore. And then we see other people who are working for darkness who the more vividly they see the light, the more they hate the light because their deeds are evil, according to Scripture. And so eventually they get mad and they, they come in on it. They come in on it, you suffer. It's, it's Jesus continuing his advance through the world, and that's what happens. As light goes into darkness, some are captured to the light, and the rest of the darkness doesn't like it. They might like it for today, because it fancies some of the things they fancy, but eventually they won't like it, and eventually they strike out. That's been the history for 2,000 years, and that's what Jesus told us happens. He goes, you know what? It's worth it. It's worth being with Christ and enduring the things that he endures so that we might enjoy the things that he enjoys and to enjoy him and enjoy the, the glory. So it says that the suffering is worthy 
because of the glory that comes. So to be a follower of Christ means that we actually go together with him, right? We, we say, not only do we say, Christ, I need you to pay for that salvation. I, I want you to be my substitute. But we say, Lord, I want to hide my identity in you. Not only are you my worth, but you're actually my purpose now. I'm on your team. My life is for you. And so, God, you are not coming back yet so that you might reach further into the darkness and um, maraud the darkness and take children out of it. Like me from Palmdale. And like many of you guys from different parts of the United States around the world, God comes and he gets us. And now we're part of this. We are, he's extending his love through his children. There's no way around it. Suffering with Christ is coupled with sharing of God's glory. And the promise that God... The promise of God is that the glory is so wonderful that it overwhelms the suffering. You and I, we can see the suffering. Oh, we got, we got the news. And then half of us in our lives, we taste the love of already. We can taste the suffering. It's harder to taste the glory of God. This is where we've got to listen. This is where we've got to pray. This is where we've got to think and trust the Lord in his promises because the suffering is before our eyes. We see it all the time. But the glory of God is something we understand by faith, educated faith. We're not making up stuff. These are things he said a long time ago, that it is worth it. So in closing this this little portion up here, I'd say this. A half-hearted following of Jesus. Welcome to Team Scott Burns. Okay, I'm not making fun of anybody here, so have coffee with me. You're going to find this. I find this to be true, that a half-hearted following of Jesus will give me a preoccupation of dread of likely suffering. A half-hearted following of him, doing just enough, right, to maintain my good status, which is totally anti-gospel stuff, right? But a half-hearted follow of him will bring me to a preoccupation, a preoccupation of dread of likely suffering, while a wholehearted following of Jesus will result in propelling enamorment with the coming glory. And I think fun, I think really truly at the bottom of us, I know us brothers and sisters, we wrestle with half-heartedness versus full wholeheartedness of following Christ. We as a tribe in this room, um, it's not a place where like tiny heartedness for Jesus lasts very long. Most of us have at least a half heartedness for him um, in our average daily thinking. And, and really if we just go, hey, I, I just like Jesus, but I do whatever I want, that usually doesn't float very long in our, in our, in our church culture. But half heartedness, now that's a game we like to do, right? Um, adorning our lives with enough of Christ to kind of get by, but, but it kills us, folks. It kills us. So half-heartedness will, in our minds, lead us to a preoccupation of avoiding suffering, but wholeheartedness will bring our hearts out into enamorment with this glory, with the one that we get to be glorified with. So I'm going to give you something. I'm just going to give you a couple seconds to pray one second before we move on, and I want you to do this. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you three things to pray about, so go ahead and bow your heads, and um, just between you and the Lord, um, ask him a couple of these things. Um, number one, ask God to show you, if he has not showed you already, what are the things that truly move and motivate you? Your hope. What are the things that truly move and motivate you throughout every day and throughout your week? Ask him just to reveal that to you very clearly now and in the coming week. And second, just ask him to show you what it means to participate in his glory. Ask him to give you more and to let your heart delight in that. And finally, ask him to make it clear how you ought to pursue that. how you ought to pursue that. Amen.